So here's the question. You want to start a business. Um, you think you've thought about it for a while. You are ready to go, but you are worried about the frustration. You're tired of seeing just the positive side of things from entrepreneurship uh, gurus and business owners, and you want to see the kind of the behind the scenes look. In this in this series of videos, this is what we'll be showing you. We'll be showing you the behind the scenes frustrations, successes, what we're getting stuck on, what we're working on, all those kind of things. My name is Jason Rivera, and this is Behind the Scenes of Value Investing Journey and Rivera Holding. Mm. Okay, so cash flows. Why am I highlighting these right here? Uh, is this account receivable or something? Yes, essentially yes. And accounts and receivable account. and accounts payable is essentially what these are. Uh, so they're taking more money than than they, than they are paying to the employee support supply yes, employee. which is good. But the reason I'm highlighting it is because the numbers are so close together. So from their brickworks. And again, I'm assuming these are brickworks until we get to the actual notes talking about this. They're only making a profit in terms of cash flows of about, what is that, $80 million? Yes. But when you yeah. add in the dividends and distributions received from their joint ventures and the, the shareholders they own, that's where they get the other money from. You see there? So they pretty much get most of the money from dividend. Yes. So that goes back to the question earlier that I had. Should they even be in the Brickworks arena? By the cash flow statement, it looks like they're making about $80 million a year. Mm -hmm. that. So, I mean, what, what's the size of this company again? It's what like you mean two, the market, market, market cap. cap? It's like a $2 billion market cap, something like that, right? It's like 2.6, 2.7. I'll have a quick look. Okay, so essentially what we can do with these numbers here is let's just say... 80 million divided by two, six, uh, 2.73. So their profit margin in term, again, in terms of cash flow from the Brickworks arena compared to their market cap is about 3%. Uh, so that means they get more than 50% of their <laughs> profits from dividends and distributions. Uh, they get actually it's about sixty percent of their dis right. of their profitability from dividends and distribution. Uh huh. Hmm. Well, they lose money. <laughs> so, another interesting part here. So, because of the arena they're in, it's a high um, operating expenditure business on a regular basis. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you have bricks. I mean, you have to have cement or whatever bricks are made out of and you have to continually make new and new, newer bricks. Mm. So that's a high capital expenditure, high operating expenditure business. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Purchase of investment in joint ventures. So they spent about $70 million more this year versus yeah. last year in investments in companies. Just developing the land or something? Could be. So Coffee this is different. where some of their cash flow came from too. Like we talked about last time, where are they get, where are they getting their profitability from? They got thirty three million dollars from selling sale or or return of investments. Well, what what do they sell? The shares of shares of uh, was it the, the SOL company? I think is what they said. Yeah. Yeah, they sold like 200 million or something. Or maybe 100 million, I can't remember. Quite a significant. So here's another significant portion right here. Debt, what we talked about last time as well. So when you factor all that in, mm -hmm. you get about negative 60 and negative 66 million in net cash flow per year, correct? Yeah. At least at this stage. At this stage. Yeah. 
What's the net increase or decrease in cash? How do you go from negative 65 million to positive 21? <laughs> So this is the net increase on a year to, or increase or decrease on a year to year basis. So this is how they get from this number. To oh, that. right, yeah, yeah. So they're pretty much breaking even. Yes, <laughs> you know why? Uh, dividend, I don't know. Uh. They're pretty much breaking it even because they're having to spend so much money on their Brickworks business mm -hmm. and because they purchased so many, uh, they purchased uh, $81 million in investments last year. Mm -hmm. So on a cash flow basis, they are essentially breaking even this year. Mm -hmm. Is that necessarily a good thing or a bad thing? Not, not necessarily. If they're investing well, it can be a good thing. Like Buffett, for mm -hmm. example. He has an $80 billion cash buildup at Berkshire Hathaway because he mm -hmm. can't find investments that fit Berkshire's model. Mm -hmm. But when Berkshire was a lot smaller, they had a lot less cash because they were continually finding new investments to invest in. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's a matter of is, is um, management doing a good job allocating capital mm -hmm. or not? If they are doing a poor job, this is a horrendous thing because essentially yeah. they're just destroying capital. Mm -hmm. To me, again, at this point, it looks like they're allocating capital pretty well. We'll get to that stage when we calculate ROIC because I don't trust Morningstar's numbers anymore mm -hmm. um, to figure that out for sure. But at this stage, I'm going to assume they're doing a good job allocating capital. All right. Okay. Okay, so here's where we get to some of not necessarily the financial engineering because that has a negative connotation to it, but some of the ways they're reporting positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not it's not necessarily a bad thing that they're doing, but you take this out here. And they're essentially not making much money from operations, correct? Because this is net mm -hmm. cash provided by operating activities before changes in assets and liabilities. Mm -hmm. Actually, you take out this number and this number, and they're essentially on an, on an operating basis not making any money, correct? Mm -hmm. And this is where you have to be careful on the cash flow statement sometimes too because these – are they invert the numbers oftentimes on the cash flow statements. So if you see something like this, it's not necessarily always a negative. If you see something like this, it's not always necessarily a positive. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you take these two numbers out. They're essentially on an operating basis about breaking even. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. And here's where they do it again. So increase, decrease, decrease, increase. <laughs> That's confusing. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, why would you? Why would a decrease be? What? They should do it, this it because these are assets up here, and these are liabilities down here. Oh right, got it. So, and again, you take this out. This out, this out, this out, and they're essentially not making much cash flow. So what's mm -hmm. keeping the business alive, in most part, in my opinion, is their investments in other companies. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, but that happened like 30 years ago. Yeah, but, no, but they're, they're still getting cash flow from the dividends. All oh, right. So this is kind of a scary thing because if that company goes down, this is kind of what mm -hmm. we talked about last time a little bit, what we were kind of alluding to last time. Let's say there's another major recession next year. 
pretty much all companies around the world and brick, I mean, brick, what do you, what's main use of brick in Australia? Is it to build houses, I'm assuming? Yeah, commercial, residential. Okay, so if there's another global recession starting next year and it hits the housing industry around the world really hard like the last time did, don't you think that this other company is going to slash their dividends? Mm, yeah, I think it will be affected as well. But the other company is quite much more diversified than this company. And that's where the problem lies because essentially this company is getting most of their cash flow from their dividends and investments in these other companies. Mm. And their other company, their other investment is in property development. So mm. they will get hit hard too. So if there's another global recession anytime soon and this company or those two entities have to slash their distributions and dividends to this, to Brickworks, their profitability and cash flow is going to be either almost non-existent or zero. And if a company has no cash flow, it essentially has to do what it's already doing, issue more debt, issue more shares, or to pay its bills, or it goes bankrupt. So essentially what I'm saying here in the long way, I'm explaining everything, hopefully you're understanding it, mm -hmm. is if, this, if there's another recession anytime soon, this company's in danger of going bankrupt. Mm. Because there's no margin of safety in the cash flow here. What about in the in the balance sheet? But they don't have much cash in there. They didn't have much cash on the balance sheet. If I remember right, they had like 22 million AUD. Yeah, that's nothing. Huh? So there's essentially no margin of safety here with the cash flows. Mm. And if they're if they don't have the cash flow, they can't pay bills. They can't pay suppliers unless they issue more debt, and the debt will be at higher rates. Because they're in trouble. They're needing to service debt. So this is why I'm not going to say all value investors, but why I consider cash flow to be more important than even operating profit and far more important than net profit. Because if you can't pay your, if you can't pay your employees, you can't pay your suppliers, you can't pay your debt, you're in massive trouble. Right, right. Okay, got it. Uh, does that all make sense? Do you have any questions about all this? Because this is super important stuff. No, got it. All good. All right. So essentially here, and Shafiq, I think, was getting falling in love with this company again, like he was with uh, IDEXY or whatever it was. Yeah. There, I mean, this company looks like a decent investment now, and it probably yeah. is going to be a decent investment when the stock crashes during the next recession. Yeah. But would I buy it now? There's no chance in hell I would buy this company now. Yeah. Because, again, there's literally zero margin of safety here. Just by looking at the cash flow. Just by looking at the cash flow statement. There's, all, there's pretty much zero margin of safety here. Because think about it. Let's say these other companies get rid of this number completely. Right. There are essentially, they would have to, so again, I'll, I'll show you right here. So essentially, what is this? Combine these two numbers right here. 85 and 43, that's what about? Um, $130 million. What's, uh, 100, yeah, no, yeah, 130, about million dollars. Uh -huh. So that leaves about $40 million, $41 million left over here. Most of that isn't even a real factor because it's from depreciation and amortization on their equipment. So that's not even a real kind of cash flow number. Uh -huh. Right. That's an accounting number, correct? In most yeah. cases. So they hey, essentially this, have a margin of safety because they only have um, because they only have to about twenty one million dollars on the balance sheet in cash. They essentially have about ten million dollars of cash flow that is kind of real world cash flow. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Does that help illustrate the point of why I said there's no margin of safety here? Yeah, I'm just getting a bit confused. Like, well, this whole thing to explain where the profit after tax is coming from. Uh, this is the cash flow statement. This does not have anything to do with pro uh, profit after taxes. That's the income statement. This is cash flow statement. They said reconcil reconciliation of net cash, net profit. Where are you looking at? Oh, right here. Uh, yeah. 
because the cash flow statement starts up here. Typically, this is a little bit backwards, and I don't, I don't know if it's the U.S. is backwards or not. But typically, in the U.S., cash flow statements start with the net profit up here, and then they go down. Uh, so what what they're doing here is is just a little. Um, again, I'm not going to say backwards isn't the right right word because I don't know if it's a U.S. thing that's backwards or. But how I kind of learned to view cash flow statements is starting at the net profit up here and then going down from there. So is this? They say the net profit is one seven and five million, and then they adjust it based on a whole bunch bunch of other non cash items. Yeah, they get the number from the income statement. Right, right. And then they go down from here. But why would they subtract share of net profit account? Why would they subtract that? Is it the fifty percent thing? Uh, Wouldn't yeah. They? Yes. Yeah. Because the share of net profit meaning their share and then using the equity method. Yes. Okay. Got it. So yeah. And if you're confused even a little bit, let me know, because like I said, this is super important stuff. So mm -hmm. did that help when I said, when I kind of broke it down and said that they getting rid of these kind of accounting numbers here and, yeah. here, and this is a real number, but, subtracting that because assuming and again you always have to assume kind of a worst case scenario and that's not even a necessarily a worst case scenario companies mm -hmm. if there's a recession and they're hit hard they just i mean it's generally a fact they cut dividends first right it's just a general fact because that's one of the easiest things to cut unless for this company but this company would be even in, in a more dire situation because they've done dividend increases for like what 30 straight years i think you said yeah so what they would likely do in this case again they have almost no margin of safety in real accounting numbers. About a $10 million margin of safety when you take out their dividend and their kind of non real world numbers, correct? Mm -hmm. So what this company, because they've raised dividends for 30 straight years, if they, if these other companies cut their dividends, what they would likely do. And I, I would say it's almost hundred percent certainty what they would do. Cause I've seen companies They'll do maintain it, right? They'll maintain, it. maintain their dividend or increase their dividend they would take out more money or they would dilute shareholders further right. or both. I've seen both happen just so they could remain on those, what the dividend King list or whatever they're called because people <laughs> invest just based on those lists. Yeah. People invest in Australia based on dividend yield. So what I can almost guarantee with hundred percent certainty that that is what the company would do instead of, instead of cutting the dividend like they should, <laughs> they would dilute shareholders and or issue debt to keep the, to keep them on those lists. Especially mm. because you said in Australia, people will invest again. This is the thing in the, in, uh, the U S as well, but you said it's a, even a bigger thing because the franking in um, yeah. Australia, people it invest makes it more dividends mm. a lot in Australia. So I can almost yeah. guarantee with hundred percent certainty, that's what they would do. Right. So moving on. So we've covered what two pages in about an hour. Mm. <laughs> no, not on about 8, 15, 8, 30, right? So in about 30, 45 minutes. Mm. So how, how important do you think this, again, two pages is right here? And understanding fully kind of what it means, what it means in a real world sense, more importantly, what it, yeah. and kind of what it helps you figure out. Yeah, I think it's really nice that you break it down. Like you get to see the full picture. Whereas if you just focus on one thing, you don't get to see the full picture. Well, I, well, thank you for saying that. But I meant for you, how important do you think this is? Like going forward? Um, like you mean the cash flow or what? No, just for you, like in your long-term kind of value investing kind of right, stuff, right. how important do you think this is? Well, I want to be able to read like a financial statement. Yeah. In this um, totality. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I mean, you get a huge advantage over other people doing this because they'll just read, they'll just kind of, even if most people won't look at financial statements at all. If they do, they'll just kind of look at the financial statements and just kind of gloss over them and look at the numbers. So you get a huge advantage over other people by actually knowing what things mean on a deep level. So you're gonna over time you'll gain a massive advantage over other mm -hmm. people.